Hi Ash, hope you're all well and enjoying the Easter holidays and keeping safe, of course. Um, I've not been updating as much, so I know lots of you are spending time with your families over the holidays. Um, but I'm so excited about this next chapter. So as I said last time, this chapter is supposed to be chapter 13, but the author it's kind of thinks 13's a bit of an unlucky number. So it's chapter 14, and it's the story of the Bergamo Brothers, part 2. When lunch hour arrived, Cass was so anxious to get back to the magician's notebook that she didn't notice the police cars and fire trucks parked in front of the school. Can you imagine Cass missing what may well have been the first real disaster in her school's history? What can I say? Even a survivalist gets distracted sometimes. I promise we'll return to those police cars and whatever terrible event it is that they foreshadow. But let's just stay with Cass for the moment. I'm sure you're almost as anxious to get back to the notebook as she was. In case for some reason you had to stop reading earlier when she did, if, say, some mean person caught you reading this book when you were supposed to be doing your schoolwork, or when you were supposed to be outside enjoying the sun, I remind you I remind you that Pietro and his brother, after accidentally stumbling on the circus, have now become part of it. As soon as Max Ernest joined her behind the gym, Cass jumped right back in and started reading aloud. After a few weeks in which we did every job from clean in after a few weeks in which we did every job from cleaning up the elephant dung to acting as the shills, the ringmaster let us put together our own circus act. The act included not only the card tricks but also the mind reading. This was perfect for us to, for us because we knew each other so well and practically and practically we had been on the telephonic communication all our lives. Also, and this will become important to my tale, we both had the condition that is called the syn syn synesthesia, the confusion of the senses. Ah, so if you want to know how to pronounce synesthesia, it sounds like anesthesia, but with syn at the beginning. So, synesthesia. The confusion of the senses. For people who have the synesthesia, the sounds and the colours and even the smells are all mixed up in our heads. When I hear the sound of scraping metal, I see a streak of bright yellow or green light. Screeching tyres are orange red. Most bells are blue. Although, when I see the blue, I don't hear the bells. I smell the soap. There was even a certain woman who needed only to say one word, and I would see a dark grey cloud and then feel like I was drowning in the coldest lake on the earth. But I am getting ahead of myself. She appears a little later in my history. If only she ever never appeared at all. What was the most helpful for our act was that for me and for Luciano, the numbers and the letters, they all had the colours. For example, the number one was green, two was purple and three was yellow. At the same time, the letter X was red, Y was grey and Z was turquoise. So sometimes seeing letter in colour is called audition colore, which means coloured hearing. It's very interesting. I can recall the day my brother and I first realised that the other people did not see letters the way we saw them. We were seven years old and a friend from the neighbourhood, she was drawing with us. She kept writing her name over and over and we kept telling her she was using the wrong colours. I am ashamed to say we were not very nice about it. Our friend started crying so loudly that our mother had to come and tell us that our friend could use whatever colour she chose. In the circus, it was very easy for us to have conversations with each other in the colour code. If I asked a girl in the audience what day her birthday was, I could tell Luciano the date simply by waving at him a few coloured scarves. He would pretend to concentrate really hard, then he would shout out her birthday like it had come to him in a trance. In this way, we seemed like very convincing psychics. Over time, our act grew into something very splendid. The ringmaster's wife, she made for us the satin capes and the turbans, and Sammy, who was now our friend. He helped us to create some magical effects with the music and the smoke and the lights of many colours. But it was after a mysterious gift arrived that our act truly came to life, and also came to an end.
One afternoon, a local boy, he brought to us a large package wrapped in brown paper. He said a beautiful lady had paid him to book the deliver him a book to deliver it to us. A fortune of money in those days. As soon as he left, we ripped open the package. At first, we had no idea at what we were looking or why it had been given to us. It was a wooden case, very old, containing dozens of glass virals. Was it some kind of chemistry kit? For what purpose was it? Only when we saw a small brass plaque that read the symphony of smells did we have the inkling. Could it be true? Were there other people in the world who experienced the music and the smells together? How fantastic! After a few days of experiments, we discovered we could make stronger the, make stronger the scents by making a fire and pouring in just a little bit from the vials. The smoke, it turned many colours, and the aromas, they filled the air. We added also a little of the gunpowder, enough to make the sparks together with the smoke and the smells. It was very exciting to see. Luciano and I, we practised every day until we were able to communicate with the smelly smoke. Smell signals, we called it. Imagine! Now I could tell Luciano the name of somebody's cat just by releasing the scent of mustard into the air. Truly, our act was now the feast for all the senses. The ringmaster, he liked it so much he bought for us a special tent with big banner announcing the amazing Bergamo brothers and their symphony of smells. Everywhere we went, he put up the posters advertising our act. And the crowds, they lined up again and again. It had been a year since we joined the circus and we were once again in Kansas. There was an article about our act in the newspaper and we wondered if perhaps our mother's cousin would come to see us. Who knew, maybe our parents had already come from Italy and they would come too. During the show, I searched the audience, but I saw nobody special. Except, that is, for a woman who stepped into our tent towards the end of our show and made me forget all about our my parents. This woman, she was so beautiful she seemed to make the whole world stand still. She had blue eyes and a waist so tiny she should have herself been a circus attraction. She had long blonde hair and she wore long elegant gloves that reached up to her elbows. Gold jewellery glittered on her everywhere. Truly, she is a golden lady, I thought. Afterwards, I saw her standing by the entrance of our tent. When the rest of the crowd had left, she smiled and told my brother and me how much she enjoyed our show. Did you like your present? She asked. It seems you've put it to good use. What present? I asked. Why, the Symphony of Smells, of course. It's quite a treasure, you know. It was made by a French doctor many years ago, a scientist by training, but he was a great lover of the arts. Before we could thank her for the gift, the Golden Lady, she said she had a proposition for us. Could she take us to the dinner and discuss it? Since we had never been to, to a restaurant before, her offer was very excited and my brother eagerly accepted it. I, however, did not want to go. I had no real reason to be suspicious, and yet, as soon as I heard her speak, I knew she was not what she seemed. Yes, you may have guessed the golden lady was the woman whose voice made me feel like I was drowning. I shiver now, just to think about it. I tried to make the excuses, reminding my brother of all the chores we had to do. He kept saying our chores would wait. What was wrong with me? Here, this nice woman was offering to take us to a real restaurant, and I went on like that. I think he was more than a little bit in love with her. Finally, the golden lady, she suggested that Luciano go for the dinner while I stayed behind. If I can't have both brothers, can't I at least have one? She asked, as if she was, the ch she was the child and we were the toys at the toy store. I could see that Luciano was nervous about being separated from me for the first time in our lives. But we were too much angry at each other to argue against the idea. My brother, he left without saying goodbye. I stayed up all the night, waiting for Luciano, imagining all the terrible things that could happen to him. When he had not returned by the morning, I searched the roads, looking for the signs of an accident. Then I searched the circus grounds, thinking maybe he was hiding from me because of the anger. My brother, he was nowhere. When I found the ringmaster inside his trailer, he looked very surprised to see me, as if I were a ghost or I had just sprouted the antlers. 
but he recovered quickly and started barking, orders, barking the orders at me. It was almost time to go. What was I doing lollygagging around? When I tried to tell him about Luciano being taken away, he said he was too busy to worry about my brother. The ringmaster, he always acted impatient like this, but he said something else which confused me. Anyway, she seemed like such a nice lady, he said under his breath. I'm sure your brother won't come to any harm. How would he know? I wondered. Had he met the golden lady? As he spoke, I noticed him pick up something from the table. It was a pile of cash and he played with it in a very nervous way. I was still young, but I'd been around long enough to comprehend what meant the money. Nowadays, it would be very shocking, but it would be a very shocking thing to sell a pair of ten-year-old twins to a stranger. This was a circus. My brother and I, we were some carnival attractions, no better than the trained monkeys. I wasn't very surprised that the ringmaster would trade us for a few dollar bills, but I hated him for it. I'll kill you, I yelled, and then I ran away from the trainer and trailer and from the circus as fast as I could. The rest of my story is 70 years long, but is really very short. I knew better than to go to the police. I was young and, Ita and Italian and a carne. Three strikes against me as far as the police would be concerned. Instead, I spent the years living on my own on the streets, searching for my brother, checking the back of every neck for that crescent-shaped birthmark. I never found so much as a single clue as to where Luciano. Except once. A couple of days after I fled from the circus, I hitchhiked to the next town where the circus had put up its tents. My plan was to murder the ringmaster in his sleep. How I intended to do this, I do not know. I had no weapons, nor any experience as a murderer. Whatever my plan was, I was too late. Where once the circus had been, there was now nothing but the ash. I wandered around the blackened fairground in a daze. Some of the larger pieces of the rubble were still smouldering and the smoke hovered above. There was also a terrible odour in the air, which at the time I thought was the smell of rotten eggs, but I now know was the smell of sulphur. I did not know exactly what had happened, but I was certain about one thing, the fire. It had been meant for me. In the middle of all the ashes and the debris, I spied a, grumpled, a crumpled piece of paper. I recognised the handwriting on it, even from metres away. It was a note from my brother, written in a code we had invented for the symphony of smells. It said one word. Help. The note, it was like a knife inside my heart. After the loss of my brother, the magic it no longer had any magic for me. Still, I had to make the living, so I performed in the parks and on the street corners, and on the trains when I could hop a ride with the tramps. Eventually, I graduated to the nightclubs and theatres, and I believe I am a success as far as magicians go. I never socialise much, however, no friend could ever take my brother's place, and today I am an old hermit. Yet I have never given up on the hope of finding Luciano. Against all reason, I feel inside me that he's still alive. One day, a few years ago, I was looking at a science magazine. The world of nature has always interested me for far more than the world of man. And I noticed an article about the synesthesia. What most caught me was the reference to a prodigy child of the 1960s. A girl so talented at the violin that she, became, she came to be an international sensation. She claimed to see the colours when she played the music, a well-known form of synesthesia. And she wrote a magnificent piece of the music called The Rainbow Sonata, when she was only seven years old. At the age of nine, she was kidnapped and never heard from again. Another child with synesthesia kidnapped? Just a coincidence? Perhaps. But it was the first clue I had found in 70 years. I had no choice but to investigate. Mysteriously, all the newspaper stories about the violinist were missing from the libraries. At last, in a used bookstore in Alaska, I discovered an old magazine article that described the circumstance of her kidnapping, according to an usher of the concert hall where she had first performed. The violinist was seen taking, talking to a woman shortly before her disappearance. 
The usher, he said the woman, was dazzling. She had the blonde hair and the gold. Ah, that's so annoying! Cass turned the notebook over and over in frustration, looking for more hidden pages. That's it? Max Ernest asked. Yeah, it just ends there. But we never found out what the terrible secret is. I know, I think maybe he wrote more, but he ripped it out. Look. Cass opened the notebook flat and pointed to a broken seam, barely visible on the inside of the spine. Like it had... Like it... Like if he had to run away really quickly and he couldn't take the whole notebook. The pages had to fit in his pocket. You mean like if he heard someone coming or he smelled fire or something? I guess that's possible, said Max Ernest. Or else maybe he was killed and the killer took the pages. Oh, exactly, Cass interrupted, grim. You know who she is, right? Who? asked Max Ernest. The Golden Lady, couldn't you tell? The Golden Lady is Miss Morve. Max Ernest shook his head. No, she's not. She can't be. Yeah, she is. Listen. Cass flipped through the notebook. She has a teeny waist, all that jewellery. She wears gloves. It does sound like her, agreed Max Ernest. But she's not the Golden Lady. It wouldn't make any sense. What? Why? Name one reason you think it's not her. Okay, here's one reason. The lady in the story at the circus, it was a really, really long time ago. If it was Miss Marve, she would be like a hundred years old now, if she was even still alive. How about that? Casper a lip. He had a point. Miss Marve didn't look anywhere near that old. Maybe if she was a vampire, then it could be her, Max Ernest suggested. But that's highly doubtful. Nobody thinks there are real vampires, except for the vampire bats. They're real. And Count Dracula. He was real, but he wasn't a real vampire. He was just a mean old guy. At least, that's what people think. There's no way to know for sure. He's dead, I mean. Unless he really was a... Okay, okay, forget vampires. I agree, it's not her. It wouldn't make any sense, I guess. So what do you think we should do? Excuse my dog barking. him. Shh! Backing at the delivery. So what do you think we should do? I think we should get rid of the notebook as fast as we can. Just like she said we should do, said at the beginning, said Max Ernest. You mean, stop the investigation? Don't you even want to know what the secret is? It's too dangerous, said Max Ernest. We're only eleven. Personally, I don't want to be kidnapped, just so just so we can know what happens at the end of the book. That's not the point, said Cass heatedly. Don't you have any sense of humour? We owe it to Pietro to find out what happened. He was such a nice man. We didn't even know him. I know, he didn't really know anybody. That's why if we could, don't continue his investigation, who will? Max Ernest didn't have an answer. Besides, Cass added, it's too late to back out. Maybe we not, don't know who Miss Morve is, but she definitely knows who we are. Oh my goodness, this is so exciting. I wonder what happens next. So chapter 15 is called Confusion of the Senses. <laughs>